Give me what? <laughs> Give me the okay. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, showing up today in support of uh, Ezra's work and to see and learn a bit more about his exit seminar. Um, I just want to introduce um, Ezra. So he did his undergrad at the University of Toronto. And in one of those semesters, he decided to go to the Galapagos and learn a bit more um, about evolution and ecology. And I was teaching a class there. I was teaching phylogenetics. And I have to say that Ezra was one of the top students in the class and was really keen to learn to use molecular techniques to study evolution. After that, he went to Costa Rica and uh, worked in, uh, in a wildlife uh, conservation center for a couple of years, and then went back to Canada to the Royal Ontario Museum to continue his work. So he's not um, a stranger to using collections. He's not a stranger to be in the field and using molecular techniques to study bigger questions in evolution. So um, he decided to join our lab uh, two years ago, and it was very easy for us to accept him, knowing a little bit about the past and the shared interest that we had. So um, today he's going to be talking to you about the work that he's been doing for the last few years, and maybe Jack can introduce a little more about his uh, journey in our lab. Yeah, and I don't have too much more to add to that. Um, one of the things that I did want to point out, so you've met Jaime Chavez, and Jaime is a new professor at San Francisco State. And, um, and one of the things I think is, is so exciting about Ezra and, and all of the graduate students that we have is that this is a pretty new collaboration. And, um, and so Jaime and I have been um, co-mentoring many of these students, and especially those that have a lot of museum interests um, that overlap um, really nicely. We've been able to, to work together on that. So Ezra is actually the first one of our students to defend and, um, and to do his exit seminar from that group. So it's really exciting to just you know, announce that collaboration and that Ezra is one of those students. And, um, and Jaime has known Ezra for much longer. Um, he came uh, two, about two years ago to, to actually start. He was kind of a part of the lab before then, but he was one of the ones who said, I'm, I'm gonna wait till this COVID thing blows over. <laughs> And then so, so he came um, after that. And one of the very few students that I've seen who finishes at, at state in, in two years, because um, most students need at least a, one more semester and sometimes two or more. So, uh, so hats off to, to Ezra for really pushing hard to try and get all of this done. Um, and partially because he's gotten into a really nice uh, PhD program that he's very excited about. So we don't want to hold him back. We want to help him get on his way um, and, and um, so here we are today to, to hear what he's going to talk about. So we also had a chance to go to Galapagos with, with Ezra. So he did a lot of the field work, and he's going to talk about that. He did all the lab work um, himself with a lot of help, of course, from folks in the CCG and, and Jim and others. And today he's going to be talking about ultra-conserved elements that resolve the phylogeny of a globally distributed species, Buteroides uh, SPP. So he's, he's actually looking at the whole genus, not just the species, and he's going to talk more about that. So take it away, Ezra. Thank you, uh, Jack and Jaime. And uh, let me pull up my notes here. There's a beautiful glare in the screen as well. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to, to you both for your mentorship uh, through this time as my advisors, my third committee member, John McCormack, uh, down here in the corner. Uh, he's with us virtually, um, and all three of them have just been such an amazing support throughout this. So yes, um, for those of you that don't know why you're here, um, I'm going to talk all about herons. You're going to hear that word a lot, as well as the word buterides, and uh, so let's let's get into it. Um, first thing I want to say is, uh, is just explain what we're going to be talking about. So I'll, I'll explain what the Buterides herons are about. We're going to go through uh, the questions that came up as we started to look about them, uh, talk about what we wanted to investigate and how we investigated it. In part three, we'll go over the results and finally talk about what all this means, what all the results mean. So stay with me. We're in it for, for the long haul, but uh, we'll get through it. So there's not gonna be any shortage of, of heron photos. So in case you were worried, that's, that's here. Um, and so if ever you need to, to wake up and see some pretty colors, right here. Um, first thing I wanna say is 
uh, just to talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, taxonomy um, and and why we use it and the main goal of it, which is to put order into the natural world, understand relationships amongst things. And there's a bunch of different ways that we've gone about doing this, but at this point, scientists have generally agreed on what we're doing, um, going from a more broad uh, group of animals all the way down to the subspecies level, which might look at a population. And so I'm not gonna talk too long about what a species is, because the longer I talk about that, the more I will upset people. Um, but I uh, generally know that, that this order Goes, goes as such from genus uh, down, and there's uh, broader ones above genus, but we're gonna be focused on those ones. And I really think the subspecific level, we're gonna be talking about a lot today, but it's really useful. Um, it, it denotes uniqueness, um, but at the same time can be a very general term. See, with, uh, with defining a species, you often require evidence from not only a molecular, not only a phenotypic, and not only an ecological standpoint, but often a combination of all those things to really define a species. And a subspecific designation can sometimes work as a placeholder, uh, where if we're not sure what's going on, we don't have all the evidence yet, we can use it. Um, and if you know that something looks different, but you don't have all the evidence yet, we can, we can do that. And, and that is the case with the Buterides herons. And that's our main goal, is to uh, finally look at this group of herons. So first I wanna talk just a little bit of background. Um, these birds are found pretty much all over the world. There's gonna be better pictures for scale, but they're really small herons. They're, they're really charismatic, I think. It's different from the great blue heron that you might see. Those ones are pretty big. Um, but they, these ones occupy mostly freshwater streams, swamps, mangroves, um, and coastlines pretty much all over the world. And they're mostly ambush predators. We have a video over here where you can uh, watch them as this one, as it looks uh, into the water, hiding from the mangroves, in the mangroves from the fish. Um, and they like to consume uh, small vertebrates and like bugs and things like that. And uh, uh, invertebrates like bugs and also these small vertebrates as this one. Pretty efficient with its grab. It, it got two fish in one uh, attack. Yeah. So within Buterides, we have two species that we're gonna be talking about mostly. Um, we have the green heron on your right, and we have the striated heron on your left. And these maps that they're attached to show their distribution. So uh, for the green heron, they live in, they're found mostly in North America, Central America, and a little bit uh, of South America in Colombia and Venezuela. For the striated heron, uh, they're everywhere else, almost every other continent, on the coastlines, in freshwater streams, all over. And the way you differentiate them, uh, aside from where you might find one, is uh, the very dark and red cheeks uh, and neck of the green heron, as you can see, and on your right, and then more brownish, grayish uh, slate of the striated heron on, on your left. And when we actually dive more into that global population, you can see that taxonomists have, have gone uh, pretty far in terms of defining subspecies. So each different color on this map here uh, defines another subspecies. Um, and there's about 30 to 35 of them, depending on the authority you ask. There's, it's just a lot. Um, so all of these proposed definitions that we see have not been off of molecular techniques. It's pretty, been pretty much entirely off of plumage, a little bit off of other morphometrics, but, uh, but mostly off of coloration. And so that, that really brings up the first question when we, when we saw this. So what are the actual relationships in this group? Uh, if we uh, look at the genetics of Buterides, um, what will we see the phyl uh, phylogenetic affinities are for the whole genus? Um, are we going to see any major biogeographic trends? Um, will we see certain structure? And you don't have to memorize this map. You don't have to memorize each color and, and how they're defined. Um, but all I want to point out is that green heron, like we said in the last slide, green heron is here, striated heron everywhere else. But there are, there are really morphometric difference, morphological difference. So, uh, so this is just one example. So these, these names aren't just thrown out there. There's still a science to it. And 
uh, you can see these Y differences in a relatively small geographic area. So I can, I'm going to use my computer's cursor maybe as a pointer. So these four specimens are found along Northern Australia and Lesser Sunda over here. So it's in a relatively small area, but we get wide phenotypic differences. Um, and so that brings us to question two. If we look deeper into the morphometrics, after we look into the genetics, how will their morphology play into this story? Um, will we see a similar story as the genetics? Um, we wanna put this combined effort together to see what the whole story really is. And if we zoom back out, um, back to this slide, there's another area to point out, and it's right in this corner of the ocean off of the coast of South America, off the coast of Ecuador. So this is the Galapagos archipelago. And on the Galapagos, there is an endemic, uh, meaning only found there, uh, population of Buterides called the lava heron. Great name, um, big fan of the name. Um, it gets a lot of attention. I mean, it's on the Galapagos, a really charismatic set of islands. Um, and it's been regarded as its own species uh, before, right? It, it looks totally different, but there hasn't really, there has not been genetic work into this group before. And recently, uh, or uh, at this point, it's kept as a subspecies of the greater striated heron group. And it's assumed that this group here uh, is uh, the most closely related uh, to the lava heron here. Um, so there's clearly a lot of reason why, uh, why scientists want to elevate it. Um, but like I said, you need a lot of data to do this. So it brings up our last question in the study. Um, where does this lava heron sit taxonomically? And after looking at the genetics and the morphology, what are we going to learn? And there's just one more, more thing that goes is that uh, in low densities, we have another morph or another uh, color pattern that's on uh, this archipelago. And they're in the Buterides family or Buterides genus. And it looks exactly like the mainland species. So here we, this individual is found on San Cristobal uh, in the Galapagos. And uh, we need to know what's going on with this group. Um, you can see there's pretty stark differences. You can see the yellow coloration on the beak, hopefully, the yellow eye spot as well as that characteristic slate gray uh, neck. Um, whereas with the lava heron, there's not really any differentiation between the cap, the neck, uh, and the rest of the body. So what, what does this all mean? And as reference, again, this is the mainland species. What does it all mean? What are these, uh, are these two unique species? Uh, is there a cline of phenotypes? Is there hybridization going on? These are all questions that come up from this that go uh, sub to the uh, third question. So just understanding what's going on with the Galapagos. Buterides question mark. Oops. So uh, for this study, for our genetics, we decided to use UCEs. Um, these are ultra conserved elements. Uh, and these are portions of the genome that are highly conserved or mostly non-changing. Um, they're regions that are scattered regularly throughout the genome. And using UCEs for phylogenetics uh, really kicked off uh, from 2012 when doctors Brian Faircloth and John McCormack, who I mentioned earlier is here with us, and other researchers, they developed these probes that can be publicly used uh, for anyone that wants to use uh, to purchase them to target these regions of the genome and extract them for sequencing with the goal uh, of phylogenetic analysis. They're really powerful for this. Um, so these UCEs, they, they serve as anchor points. Using the sequences of one organism's UCEs uh, can find a completely different organism's UCEs, as you can see in this cartoon in the bottom. Uh, this is just an example. It's not a scientific graph or anything like that, but you can see the differences. You can find uh, the idea is that all of the core UCE is, this, is more or less the same between organisms of wildly different groups, um, and then you can compare the regions directly attached um, to, this, uh, to the UCE. And that point's really important because it's not the actual UCE that holds the phylogenetic weight. It's the flanking regions um, that we're focused on. And I'll bring out the pointer again on this graph so that people on uh, YouTube can, can see this, hopefully. Um, on this graph here, um, we have the core UCE defined, and it's defined on both. These are just two examples. 
And on the x-axis here, you can see the distance uh, from the center of the alignment. So with the zero being the center of the UCE. And the y-axis are the frequency of variant bases. So as you get further away from the core UCE, you get a regular increase in variability and a predictable increase in variability. And as you get, so as you get further away, um, we can see the differences. And that's really how we infer these phylogenetic relationships. So this is really uh, valuable data that we're targeting and hold a lot of weight. These regions are spread throughout the genome, so there's relatively little bias. And you only need a fraction of the data compared to whole genome sequencing. So that means it'll cost a fraction of the amount of, of this whole genome sequencing to get uh, pretty similar results. Now, obviously, whole genome sequences holds a, a ton of other benefits, but if you're looking at phylogenetics, these UCEs have been very useful. So to give an overview uh, of our questions, our main questions that we're looking to answer with this study. The first one, um, how are these disparate groups across the world, how are they actually related to each other? What are the, what are the phylogenetic uh, signals that we're seeing? What role does morphology play in this? Does it follow the same thing as the genetic story? And where does the lava heron sit taxonomically? Don't worry, we got another picture. So here's what we did. First thing we had to do was uh, get our tissue samples. So the rest of the distribution maps I'm going to show you are going to look a lot like this. They're going to be color coded by bioregion. So North America, purple, South America, green, and so on. And don't forget, in Galapagos, we have this in this corner. They're going to be marked blue, like the ocean. I don't know. It might be hard to see. Um, so each of these circles represents tissue that we were able to request from different museums for genetic investigation. Uh, we requested as much as we could all the available tissue from these museums that are shown at the bottom here. Um, and this is the distribution we were able to get. Um, it's pretty wide sampling. We're, we're happy with what we got. It's not every population, um, unfortunately, but we should be able to see some major biogeographic biogeogra trends from this. And the total number of samples, uh, tissue samples in the study is 33. And for anyone curious, this is the amount of tissue that you get when you request it. Um, definitely didn't stress me out when I saw that to make sure that I only had one shot, but it worked out. <laughs> and um, so as my advisor said uh, to in, uh, introduce this, we got to go to uh, the Galapagos. I'm so fortunate to say that we had an amazing field season out there and take the first genetic samples of the lava heron. And this is really, this is, my, this is why I'm a biologist. This is everything for me. Uh, to me, there's, there's just nothing like getting to be able to see your study subject uh, do its thing in nature. Um, whether it's it's hunting, whether it's grooming itself, like this center top picture shows, uh, whether it's courting, like this picture on the bottom right shows, uh, when they when they start to court, their legs flush this brilliant red color, um, or even rearing its young. This is a juvenile that's that's hunting with its parents nearby, um, who are not happy when we tried to get a little bit of its blood. But um, and here are some more pictures of the field season. Um, this is me, uh, very focused, determined. I, I'm making eye contact with that heron. Baseball cap is backwards. I got the net and definitely never caught a heron that way. That is not how you catch a heron. It's more, more like this. Um, if you can see at all, we have these very thin structures set up on a coastline of lava rocks. Um, this is called a mist net. Generally, they're used for really small passerines, really small songbirds uh, that won't knock down a net. We decided to try it for lava herons. Uh, and they're usually not meant to stand up uh, between lava rocks that are both slippery and insanely sharp. But we uh, managed to catch a few. Um, and so when we catch one, uh, we do a little bit of processing. We measure them. Uh, we take pictures. Uh, we mark them. And we take a little bit of blood. And uh, we make sure that they stop bleeding before we send them off on their way. So totally uh, live capture um, and release and a few more pictures of us processing them. Um, yeah. 
And on top of the museum samples, on top of the lava heron blood samples that we took, there were two more samples added to the study. Jaime Chavez, uh, in a few years prior to our field season, he was actually, him and his team was able to uh, actually catch an individual uh, of the striated morph on Galapagos. So this is that individual uh, that looks like the mainland, but they're found on Galapagos. So we have that sample in our study. And then as an outgroup uh, to, to sort of uh, what's called rooting, uh, the clade is we have a black crown night heron as well, so that we know something that's not closely related to the others is outside of it, or not as closely related as everyone else in the study. So we have our tissue. The next thing we need to do is extract the DNA and get it ready for sequencing. This is me, very diligent in the lab, down in the CCG. Um, this is the general uh, methodology that I use to prepare my samples for genetic sequencing, starting with just extracting the DNA from your blood and tissue. There's a lot of prep involved for building what's called a theory, um, of that has the information that you want to sequence, and it includes putting indices on them where uh, uh, they're tagging each individual sample so that when they're sequenced, you can identify what DNA belongs to what sample. Um, and after you put an index on, uh, you want to attach what are called UCE probes. These are essentially targets that attach to your DNA for those UCE regions. And then you're able to wash away everything else, ideally, that's not a UCE, that's not bound DNA. And ideally, you're just left with what you want to, and you can sequence that. And so the goal is to get, remember, not only those UCEs, but also those regions directly touching the UCEs. So uh, once uh, our DNA is sequenced, we have to make sense of the data that comes back. Um, so uh, for that, uh, we used uh, what's called Filucci, and it's a pipeline designed specifically for UCEs, and it's a fantastic. It takes care of 90% of the work you need to do, um, and very uh, comprehensive tutorials as well. And what it does essentially is it takes your reads and processes and processes them. You know, gets rid of the adapters uh, from the sequencing machine, gets rid of duplications, and then you use a program called Spades to uh, assemble what are called contigs. Those contigs are mapped to your UCE probes. So it's essentially like matching like with like. You have the sequences of the UCE probes. Uh, you, you know what those are. And so you do a control finds uh, option for those sequences, essentially. You want to filter out any reads that are poor, uh, anything that doesn't have good enough coverage, something that, that, doesn't, that uh, didn't sequence quite properly. And finally, you want to choose your final UCE data set. And, so this is important because not all samples actually get sequenced uh, with the same amount of data. So it doesn't always work out perfectly. It's, uh, it kind of felt like throwing your, your data into a black box. But uh, after you get your samples, you can see what actually happened. And your final data set is a bit of a dance uh, between including as many of the 5,000 UC loci that you're going for um, as possible but you also don't want to have include taxa that have too much missing data. And so you want to make sure that you have good sequencing coverage uh, without too much missing data. Now we also added this extra step. We did a SNP analysis, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, to verify our data set. It's a subset of the UCE data set, so it's not too different. Um, but finding and analyzing uh, only the variable parts of your multiple sequence align uh, alignments, they're uh, a great way to confirm a topology of your nuclear data. And so it would remove all of uh, your core UCE um, that uh, doesn't really hold phylogenetic signal. And the pipeline is from Anderman 2019. It's a Python extension that worked pretty easily. And finally, this is something that, uh, that I had no idea you could do uh, until being here, but uh, you can actually extract uh, mitochondrial DNA as a subset uh, of your sequencing. Uh, I didn't target mitochondrial data in my sequencing process, but essentially there are enough mitochondria everywhere um, that it just gets sequenced as a byproduct, and you're able to do that Control-F 
a control find function to be able to find your, your data sets. So it's very similar, you know, you take your process reads and you'll, you make your contigs again. Um, you map those assemblies instead to UCE probes, you map them uh, to a mitochondrial reference genome. From that map, you're able to organize the samples and call the variations from the reference so that you have each sample's unique mitogenome. You align those data, uh, you trim them, and you create your multiple sequence alignment. Oops. And a little disclaimer that unfortunately for the blood samples that we took, there's, there's just not a lot of mitochondria in blood. So uh, we did have to cut some of the mitogenome uh, to be able to put those samples in. Remember, all the samples from Galapagos, those are blood, not tissue. So we are able to take our final data sets and we can run them into a phylogenetic analysis. We end up with two data sets that we talked about, the nuclear data set, which are UCEs, and we have our mitochondrial data set. And for our nuclear data set, we decided to go with a 75% complete data matrix. Remember, I was talking about this dance. It means that for every UCE locus, if 75% of the 33 taxa, if less than 75% of the 33 taxa were not represented, then that locus was kicked out of the data set. Um, and uh, so that's the, the dance, the balance that I was talking about of making sure uh, that you have a complete enough data set to actually get some phylogenetic signal from that. So in the end, it led us to 3,400 UC loci out of the 5,000 that were targeted, uh, still pretty solid amount of data. And we ran that through multiple uh, analyses. We did a maximum likelihood test through uh, IQ tree and a Bayesian analysis through Mr. Bayes. And if you remember that SNP data set was a subset of our uh, UCEs. We had to cut a bit of data um, from our uh, uh, from that data set. Not every taxon had the variable site. So we had to make sure doing that dance again and we ended up with 25 taxa within that. And a data set of 517 SNPs. And we ran that through its own Bayesian analysis program, SNAP, um, which is an add-on to uh, BEAST. Now for the mitochondrial data set, um, again, I mentioned we had some missing data uh, problems. Uh, we got an alignment length of 3,000 base pairs, um, also pretty good, and we did a, a Bayesian analysis um, with Mr. Bayes again. So uh, here we're talking about the uh, how the morphological data collection went. And I was really fortunate to get to go to some of the best museums in the country. Uh, California Academy of Sciences, Chicago Field Museum, and American Museum of Natural History. That picture of me scarily looking uh, really happy is at the Chicago Field Museum in front of a dead, bunch of dead birds. Um, never been happier. <laughs> For two weeks, I got to uh, hang out in the basement of the American Museum, uh, just looking at birds nonstop and measuring them. It's my very professional photo studio that I set up. Um, Definitely didn't fall and drop dad's camera. Sorry, dad. Um, but uh, we ended up getting, oh, do we have some feedback? <laughs> uh, we ended up getting some pretty good photos. And so we took photos of every single bird that we measured, um, which is 308 specimens. Um, and uh, it represented 29 designated subspecies. So pretty wide distribution. And what we actually measured is the wing uh, of the animal. I think we all know what a wing is. Um, a tarsus. Um, of each specimen. The tarsus is the area between the knee and the ankle of the birds, so measuring size. And then the culmin, which is uh, the beak of the individual. And we took that data set from the nares, uh, both the, all the length, the width, and the height. Um, it just reduces a lot of error when you're not sure where the end of the beak is or the start of the beak is from the skull. And by taking all of these data, we can pull off a really large comparative study, and we can marry it also with the genetic data to, to make the analysis even more powerful to remember compare stories. And if we wanted to look at where all of those samples are from, it would look like this. Um, it's a distribution map. Again, we're colored by bioregion, and each circle is a specimen that was measured. I didn't go to all those places, but they came to me. So. Finally, we get to talk about what we actually found. This is a lava heron in its natural environment. If you can't find it, 
uh, their camouflage pretty well. So again, here is our uh, tissue distribution. So this is where each tissue is found. And we get our phylogenetic results. So this is our UCE tree. This is our consensus tree. Um, I'm not too worried about you seeing all the text. I'm sorry, that's very small. I'll point out the big important things. But what you can see is uh, if two branches are connected, that means they're most closely related. And if they're color coded, they're matching the bioregion of interest. So orange is with Africa, uh, yellow is with Australia and, and Southeast Asia or the rest of Asia and so on. Um, and so you can see here, hopefully, well, if not, then I'll point it out. We have actually really, really high posterior values. So we're very confident that this is the topology. Now, I said this is the Bayesian consensus tree, um, but we also got the maximum likelihood tree and that really confirmed uh, this topology as well. We were able to run constrained tree analyses uh, to see the likelihoods of other topologies and none of them panned out uh, like this did. Um, and we'll, we see a bit of structure. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, when we go into the discussion, we'll talk more about, uh, about what it all means. Um, but I do want to point out that that individual that looked like the striated heron in Galapagos um, is right here, uh, grouping with the rest of the lava herons. And we'll get into what that means also. Now, our UC SNP data set, it's, it's, uh, it's from the same data set, so it should show the same results, right? And it mostly does. Um, uh, we didn't, don't have the same amount of taxa uh, represented in here, but you see we have uh, some, some really confident values, some really confident structure in Africa, Australasia, uh, Galapagos and North America here as well. The only difference really is that we weren't able to get a confident set on the South American striated heron. Um, so uh, sometimes it's mapping with the old world, with the rest of the striated heron. Sometimes it's with the new world. It didn't really uh, resolve, but we have our UC, our large UC data set that confirms uh, that is more confident at least. And again, I want to point out Galapagos striated individual is right there, at least the striated morph. Now, our mitochondrial DNA shows something a little bit different. Uh, there's something funny going on. Uh, if you didn't notice before, all of a sudden now we have blue grouping with green. Uh, and so that's all that hubbub about old world and new world splitting. We don't really get that here. We have uh, old world, we have new world grouping sometimes with old world, uh, but we don't have very strong posterior values. So it's a little wishy-washy. But what's not wishy-washy is that uh, the North American green heron is really still confident in itself. And the lava heron all of a sudden ditched the green heron and is now with the South American heron. It's a little bit funny what's going on. Assumptions for mitochondrial uh, genetics is a little bit different. Um, so we're going to get into that, but I want to talk about uh, our morphometric results as well. There's going to be a lot going on in this slide. Just want to warn you, uh, but everything's color coded still. So just focus on our bioregions. Um, but general, the general structure of these graphs are that each rectangle and the whiskers uh, attached to those represent a population or a subspecies. And uh, the group of the uh, subspecies matches a bioregion. So this is Africa here, Australasia, South America, North America, Galapagos. And this big gray stripe in here rec uh, represents the global average with a standard deviation, positively and negatively. And what you see is most things are, are hanging out inside that gray shaded area. Um, what's important is when you see a rectangle, especially its little black bar, such as this one, popping outside into its own color. That means it is deviating from the average. So we see the wing length in this graph here. Um, we have a few that are below the average, a few that are above the average, and tarsus length, something kind of similar. A lot are hanging out in the middle, but we get a few that are popping out below, a few that are coming up above, uh, and so on. And now with our Coleman size, um, we have a lot more hanging out in that global average. Um, most of them actually are hanging out in this global average, but there's one group 
that we can see really sticks out. And that is the Galapagos group right here. So this has been seen before. Uh, this has been noted before. The Galapagos lava heron do in fact have thicker bills and it's been attributed uh, to their consumption of hard-shelled crustaceans. They, that makes up a much higher proportion of their diet than, uh, than other populations of striated heron. I mentioned they mostly eat small vertebrates like small fish or invertebrates like, like cockroaches and things and tide pool cockroaches. I'm not a, I'm not a marine biologist. Um, yeah, so that seems to have affected their actual morphology. And when we put everything into a large data set and we attach the bioregions that we've learned from our phylogenetic data, we start to see uh, uh, we can run a discriminant function analysis that maps the populations from each bioregion onto the graph. Each square represented here is the centroid of the group or, or the median, uh, the middle of the group. I took out all of the individual data points because it just made it very noisy and hard to read. Um, but you can see we get a little bit of grouping here. Um, and all the data are included in this, uh, in this graph, but there are functions that are more dominant or variables that are more dominant on each axis. And I've pointed them out on the graph that on the X axis here, function one, Coleman height and width comes out as the dominant function. And in function two, the Y axis, we see tarsus length coming out a lot. So this, we see some grouping, right? Some maybe some new world, old world uh, grouping. Uh, Galapagos is way out here. Seems seems kind of important, but we'll get to that. Uh, thankfully, with this slide telling us what it all means. So let's go back to these questions, right? I want to make sure we're all up to speed. We'll start big. We'll go small. Uh, how are these disparate groups actually related? So that's the first thing we're going to answer. Hopefully, answer. So the, for the first time, we get to see evidence of genetic structure, of phylogenetic structure. Um, and again, we have these pretty confident data sets. You know, uh, these posterior values are really high. We get uh, Sub-Saharan Africa grouping with itself. We get Australasia grouping with itself. But we get something interesting. This is uh, uh, the Brevips, the Brevipes subspecies. And these are located in North Africa along the Red Sea. And it seems like we get a pretty strong biogeographic barrier. Uh, that might be the mountains of Ethiopia and uh, the Saharan Desert, because they're grouping most closely with the rest of Asia. And uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to make it into the SNP data set. So, um, uh, so it's hard to, to really nail down what's going on there, but uh, definitely warrants some more investigation. Um, and then we see that we have some split uh, in the new world. Uh, we have uh, something actually kind of unexpected. Now, it's uh, all assumptions up to this point have been that the lava heron is most closely related to the South American striated heron. But what this is telling us actually is their most closely, their most uh, recent common ancestor is shared with the green heron of North America and Central America. So completely, uh, so pretty different from what we've come to expect. And both data sets agree with this topology. Um, in fact, the green heron is sitting, or sorry, the South American heron, striated heron, is grouping pretty confidently uh, outside of them as an outgroup. Now, are we able to determine that we can split up old and new world butyrides herons? Um, and I think there could be merit to that question, but but more samples definitely would help out with being able to really answer this. And again, pointing out that uh, striated morph in Galapagos, it's not grouping at all with the striated heron of South America. Genetically, this individual is a lava heron. So what do morphometrics say about this? What does the morphology tell us about this? So let's pull up all these graphs again. We'll look at the most dominant functions uh, the most dominant variables. And I just showed evidence of how plumage uh, might not be a strong identifier, right? Because we thought that individual was a striated heron originally, but genetically, like I said, it's a lava heron. So let's look at this morphological data 
and these most defining variables. Again, this x-axis, Coleman. So you can see these uh, four groups are mostly staying along the same x value. So Coleman doesn't really factor into a predicting uh, a predictable group. Whereas Galapagos, this discriminant function analysis, excuse me, uh, this discriminant function analysis is able to see the values associated uh, with an individual and based off of its Coleman, it can see that it is a Galapagos heron. Now, uh, the Y value is uh, mostly looking at the Tarsus and we see a little bit of separation. It's not huge, but we do see some new world, old world, world separation. And if we look at this graph, uh, it's not a great graph at, at showing the amount of samples in our study, so it's hard to see the weight uh, involved with the, the means. But you can see here, we definitely have some individuals that are pretty low in Africa in terms of Tarsus length. We have more individuals over here that are also very low. We have a few that are above average, um, but the 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 mean for the bioregion is pretty low and uh, the same can be said or the opposite can be said about the striated heron and the green heron of south america and north america again you can see it above this uh the mean but they haven't really escaped the the global mean the global average so they're higher but not by a lot how does the uh sorry <laughs> Where does the lava heron sit taxonomically, the meat of this talk? So what makes a species? So this is something we sort of talked about at the beginning. So it, it involves a lot of steps. Um, I don't want to step on toes, but generally when we are able to see a combination of genetic, phenotypic, and ecological uniqueness, there is evidence to elevate a species, to elevate a population into a species. You want to make sure that a species is not only recognized by its unique evolutionary history, but also might have a unique future. This is a heron. This is a, a population of herons that are isolated from its most recent common ancestor. It has a unique feeding ecology, as we saw from the morphometrics. And here's an amazing picture of a lava heron grabbing one of those crabs. And that, uh, that unique feeding ecology has led to nature selecting for wider and larger beaks. And the uh, genetics also are telling us a similar story as well. They are grouping incredibly strongly with themselves, separate not only from uh, the green heron, their closest relative, but who we assumed was their uh, closest living relative, the, the striated heron of South America. There's definitely taxonomic work that needs to be done before we can say this is its own species. But I think we have a really interesting case here um, and definitely merits uh, a look into this. Speaking of that interesting case, though, let's go back to that mitochondrial uh, data. Um, so the nuclear data we were talking about shows a very clear story. Um, and we like that story. It's nice. But our mitochondrial data says something kind of different. Pretty different, actually. Uh, we see rather than these two blocks, the blue and pink blocks being most closely uh, related to each other, instead we see some blue and green and blue again. They're kind of split up in here, but uh, pink is still identifying really strongly as itself. That's the, the green heron. So, so what, what's the story here? And mitonuclear discordance is, is not necessarily a, a rare phenomenon. We know it happens. It's not super common either, but what we do know is when we see it, something really interesting is happening demographically. So, so why does this happen? Um, well, the genetics are, they're different with mitochondria, right? Mitochondria are haploid. They only have a single copy passed down through the mother, whereas uh, nuclear DNA is diploid. Um, so that effectively means that for every one copy of mitochondrial DNA, four copies of nuclear DNA are passed to the, to the next generation. And because of this, you can get fixation of certain traits or even in the entire mitogenome really quickly in a population uh, compared to your nuclear genome. Essentially, your effective population is much smaller for your mitogenome than your nuclear genome. So 
mitonuclear discordance can happen, can be attributed to uh, a few reasons, ones that we don't really have time to explore too deeply here. But the ones that might be applicable here to the study um, are adaptive introgression and uh, some sex-based asymmetries that might be attributed to migration. So in the case of adaptive introgression, uh, nature might, might be selecting for traits uh, of a natal population from a population that might be moving into a different niche or a different environment. So this can uh, cause uh, incomplete lineage sorting or ILS uh, from older introgression events. Another option, another possibility is this migration based sex asymmetries where maybe one sex uh, is migrating or maybe uh, one population is migrating uh, into another species territory and then uh, different species hybridize or different populations hybridize. And this can lead to mitochondrial capture of one species mito uh, mitogenome flowing into another. Um, this can occur from uh, also from a case of secondary contact after isolation. But like I said, unfortunately, so this is not a mitochondrial study. Um, but for a mitochondrial study to occur, these are questions that uh, need to occur to have an evidence-based hypothesis and actually uh, look into this. So it doesn't make everything nice and clean, uh, but it definitely says that this group is even more interesting than I had thought. Um, I would say that, that we're probably seeing some level of hybridization um, or migration uh, based on these, these data, but the investigation is really gonna tell us whether it is a recent introgression event, you know, whether it's a secondary contact after isolation, or maybe it's uh, ILS from earlier, uh, maybe even before the lava heron made it, the lava heron ancestor made it to Galapagos, and then that ancestor might have carried it into the islands. Now the story is definitely not complete for the lava heron. Um, a lot of interesting things are going on. I hope you were able to take away take that away uh, from this talk. Unfortunately, there's just not enough time for a master's thesis to answer it, despite my, my uh, original thinking. For instance, what's happening with the plumage of the lava here? And we just, we don't have the answers for it. For instance, uh, the study from Hayes in 2013 uh, pointed out a hybrid zone uh, in Panama showing and scoring uh, plumage coloration on a score of one to eight. This is that picture I showed in the beginning of a small geographic region having very uh, widely varying uh, uh, striated herons. And there we go. <laughs> and with this study, we've shown that uh, the striated morph on Galapagos is genetically a lava heron. So what's going on with these polymorphisms on the island? And one other thing I want to point out that we, we saw from this study is is some interesting things going on with wing length and the ecology of certain populations. So if we look at a few individuals here on the bottom that I've circled, uh, these circles correspond with the circles on the bioregion and on the top. Now, uh, these are wing lengths that are deviating from the global norm by being much, much smaller. Uh, and also these three populations happen to be on islands. Now, an island miniaturization effect is a pretty common uh, uh, effect for really isolated individuals, especially those that might not have predators. So this would be incredible to look into. We just did not have much data to, to go into that. Another uh, pattern that we saw are, is these two individuals uh, that are above the average for wing size. These are also the only two migratory populations. So. This is also a link that we know exists. Um, and if I had time, I would also love to be, I would be inclined to investigate more. Uh, this, sorry, I'll point with this, this migratory population. You know, vagrancy is a relatively common phenomenon where birds might show up in places where they're not uh, accustomed to being. And maybe along the way, we get some hybridization with striated adherence. Um, and, we could even get some fixation of striated mitochondrial DNA into a population. 
But uh, uh, investigation into the origin of the law of Aharon, these are just claims I'm making. I don't have evidence to back it up. But further investigation of the law of Aharon that asks these questions, including maybe a time calibrated phylogeny that can estimate when the ancestor actually showed up on Galapagos, those might be the, the final items that really push this across the finish line in terms of determining the species status of the heron, the, the Galapagos lava heron. But alas. Um, anyway, if there's anything to, uh, to take away from the study, uh, it's that more attention should be paid to this group. You know, it's a, it's a really unique study subject. There's a lot of interesting things going on uh, that we didn't know until we looked at. I'm just, I'm so grateful that I've gotten to work on it for the last two years. Uh, unfortunately for now, I'll be handing off uh, this work to another researcher that wants to take it up. Um, we do plan on uh, submitting the work I've presented today uh, for peer review and for uh, hopefully eventually publication. Uh, for me, like we mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be taking everything I've learned, which is just, uh, I can't even comprehend how much uh, it's been over the last two years, and I'm going to apply it to my PhD program. Uh, that I'll be starting in August at the University of Montana in Missoula. And so excited. Um, Vanessa and I are moving in four days, so wish us luck. Um, but finally, I just want to uh, acknowledge some people that, that made all of this happen. Um, so for technical support um, from Cal Academy uh, and the Center for Comparative Genomics, uh, this study absolutely would not have happened without uh, Mo Flannery, uh, the collections manager, uh, Athena Lamb, who runs uh, CCG, the, the Center for Comparative Genomics, and Lynn also I would not have made it <laughs> through all the genetic work, all the lab, the wet lab work. Uh, and then also, Kel, thank you so much for, for getting all of this set up today. Um, I want to thank members of uh, uh, who I was in contact with from the other museums uh, who not only coordinated uh, the uh, my applications for tissue sample requests, but also coordinated my visits uh, to actually go there and work in person. That's Paul Sweet. Uh, that is Chris Malinsky. That's Ben Marks. And finally, the the also the Galapagos uh, National Park System. Uh, we absolutely would not have. Uh, uh, been able to do anything without their approval. And so their collaboration and their support of this project just absolutely made this happen. And Jason uh, Castañeda El Gato uh, is a magician in terms of being able to get into the minds of herons and be able to, to catch them for, uh, for this work. And financially, uh, the American Museum uh, funded this project not once, but twice. Uh, San Francisco State gave us some instructionally related awards and my main sources of funding, uh, the Chavez Dumbacker Lab. Um, and on the note of the Chavez Dumbacker Lab, I'm so grateful to have gone to work with this group. Um, many of them are, are here today. Uh, Adan, Daniela, Raquel, uh, Pune, Lore, uh, thank you all so much for being amazing uh, colleagues. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I think we're gonna be hanging out here afterwards. Um, uh, for snacks, beverages, um, and yeah, just thank you so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll start with any questions that the audience might have. So if you have any questions, you can mic this and pass it up. Oh my God, the mic was never on. It was on. It was oh, it was on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for agreeing. I have two questions. Yeah. The first is whether in your analyses of the nuclear data, if you considered any methods that account for reticulation or gene, given the mitochondrial nuclear discordance that you saw. I would have loved to get into uh, more population genetics. It's not my, my strong suit. I'll start with that. But also, we got the results of this mitonuclear discordance about two weeks ago. And so uh, this uh, was just opened up a whole new can of worms that I'm still wrapping my head around. And my second question is about the striated individuals in Galapagos mm -hmm. and whether it has similarly distinct peak dimensions as the lava morphs or whether this peak is more similar to the continental population. That's a great question. It might be a great uh, identifier in the future, but we did not get the actual measurements uh, from that individual as far as I know. Um, 
And so if in the future we're able to catch them, we can definitely compare their beak sizes and see uh, and, and get a feel for that. But that'll, again, being able to combine everything genetically, morphometrically, that's really gonna, gonna tell us what's happening, uh, whether this is a unique species. Great job, Ezra. Um, I had a question. A lot of what you're interested in seems to be the biogeography of these um, like subspecies or um, geographic populations. Is it is it known or does your analysis um, help inform like maybe the ancestral like origin of pewterides or maybe sister group to pewterides help inform that too? That's a really good question. Um, and one that we can't definitively answer with this, again, getting that time calibrated phylogeny will really help uh, get us a better idea of the origins of butyrides uh, and also being able to include uh, other closely related uh, genera into the study. But we can see from our uh, phylogeny, we get a little bit of uh, information from branch lengths, um, though it's not a lot, and being able to understand uh, where the biggest differences are. And so um, we can see uh, what, uh, yeah, what sequences are most different. So we can't really definitively say where this group originated. Um, yeah, with the uh, most diversity uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of actually speciation happening in the Americas, that would be the first place that I would venture a guess, but but again, more research needs to go into that. Awesome, great job. Thank you. Great talk, um, Ezra. I'm always interested in sort of thinking about the phenotypic evolution of uh, the genomic basis for phenotypic differences. And what I'm curious about is what would you think would be the minimum amount of genomic differentiation to create a lot of heron from either of your two, at least at the beginning of your studies, hypothesized um, ancestral or, or uh, origin populations. The minimum amount of differentiation right. from the... How many genes would you need to make a lot of heron? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, so something we're really curious about is, is absolutely looking at the MC1R gene. Uh, that's just a single gene that's often uh, associated with, with melanism. And something I would, I, if I had time in this talk to, to mention was the presence of uh, melanic uh, individuals in other parts of the world, because we are seeing uh, melanic uh, green herons in Central America. We're also seeing melanic striated herons in Africa so this is a mutation, or it could be a series of mutations that could be happening regularly. And so uh, if it's happening regularly in the green heron and the striated heron, uh, it, uh, like it, could, it could come from almost anywhere. But uh, the, uh, we just know that MC1R has occurred in, in other uh, avian taxa. And so that would, we've talked about that one being uh, our central focus uh, for being able to see that. But to be able to get maybe genetic differences for beak sizes, I don't, I don't know what's associated with that, to be able to see the, really the morphometric differences. Right. So given that you could have as, as little as a single locus mm -hmm. a lava here, what's the likelihood you'll find a phenotypic by genotypic correlation with any random locus? Any UCE. Any UCE, that's right. Um, that would have helped to do a uh, uh, similarity matrix on the uh, on the phylogenetic results. Yeah, the answer is actually very low. Very low? Very low. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get you to think in terms of from, from the phenotypic point of view, it's a different method for looking for those correlations. But it's really cool. And um, <laughs> I think the cool thing was that at the beginning of the talk, I thought, oh, this is going to be really obvious. We're going to have striated, and it's going to be a, a migrant from striated herons. And you surprised us that they're closer to green herons. So that's super neat. 
So I'm be really interested in what the phenotypic, uh, the genetic basis of phenotypic differentiation is in those two groups. So thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions in the room? I think it is that time that we go to the committee questions, perhaps. Um, we can't get John up, but we're going to put him in front of you two in chat. So, pass it. Any questions? <laughs> um, just looking at your mitochondrial phylogeny, um, which do you think is, if you think that there was some introgression or gene flow, which do you think is the most likely? Source population and and which which direction do you think gene flow went and why do you think that based on your treatment? If you even have an idea, or yeah, if there's information there that might answer the question. From what uh, from what I was able to pick up recently on uh, mitonuclear discordance, my my assumption based off of our nuclear data set is that is that this is true is that this. Uh, uh, what it is showing is is the state, which is that lava heron is most closely related to the green to the green heron, uh, and so my guess is as uh, the ancestor of the lava heron was making its way to Galapagos, there was gene flow from a equatorial group uh, from an equatorial population that might have had some adaptive capabilities uh, for the local region that flew uh, that. Uh, flowed into the green heron population. And what was the second part of your question? So you think that the so so you think that there's information in your mitochondrial tree su suggesting that there's gene flow into the green heron. Uh, in which direction? If if, if the ancestor of the lava heron. Sorry. So the ancestor of the lava heron. That there was gene flow. Uh, mitochondrial gene flow from the striated heron. From the striated heron into the lava heron? Yes. And that's based on just first principles, or is there something in the tree that suggests that to you? Um, the fact that they are branching uh, with the striated heron um, pretty confidently, not, not with great posterior values, but some of them are in there, are telling us this, but also the fact that the striated heron is mostly basal in this tree. Um, we're seeing the terminal branches be more, uh, or rather the in-group being more the striated heron. And so what the mitogenome tree uh, is kind of is showing to us, right? We have, where's the cursor? We have so these branches blue here. Galapagos? Blue is Galapagos. Okay, so which is more basal then? So we're seeing Galapagos here that's basal. Okay. So this is telling us that the striated heron came from the lava heron, which is feels extremely unlikely. Um, and so the fact that uh, we're seeing the striated heron mitochondria come up, uh, come out of the lava heron means that there's probably some introgression coming from that group, I would say. Which is that group again? Uh, there is mitochondrial uh, introgression coming from the striated heron. From yeah, into potentially from either a secondary contact event or a hybridization along the way to Galapagos. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to follow up on question from Jeff. Uh, yes. Uh, so if there was gene flow from South America and straight to Harris to the Galapagos, why is that not being caught on the UCEs? So uh, what I had mentioned, uh, uh, earlier about the causes for mitonuclear discordance. Um, fixation in mitogenomes happens really quickly and can happen really quickly. Um, basically, the effective population size for mitogenomes is much, much smaller. So not only if you find an adaptive trait that it can fix really quickly, but also with the effective population size being so much lower, genetic drift is effect, uh, also a much bigger factor. And so that can also influence fixation. And so uh, because the mitogenome has that much smaller effective population size, um, it becomes really prevalent in the tree for the mitogenome. But the UCE nuclear is uh, many orders of magnitude larger than the uh, 
than the mito tree, even just the UCEs. If you're, we're not even looking at the rest of the mito or the rest of the nuclear genome, uh, it's that much bigger. It makes it that much harder for a single trait or even uh, twenty thousand base pairs to fixate uh, to fix in a population. So one of the things that I think is really striking is the amount of um, structure in the diversity that you find within the lava herons compared to even the green heron with a massive geographic distribution. What do you think is the original history uh, that could explain the large amount of genetic diversity that you see on your Atlas heron um, compared to areas like South America or North America? I'm sorry, can you say that question? from <laughs> the, yeah, the first so part of that again. You see your blue um, yeah. there, right? You have so much structure. Yeah. Quite long front, just even compared to a population that has geographic distribution across North America, mm -hmm. like your yeah. green area, and even South America. Usually most of these island populations tend to have very strong bottlenecks yeah. and a very reduced right, okay. diversity. What do you think is happening? So there being such a uh, solid structure within uh, the Galapagos. Now, these samples are from two different islands. Uh, it's not just from one island. We were able to get data from both Santa Cruz and San Cristobal. And we might be seeing some structure between the islands as well. And, uh, and there is some evidence of, of this split, I believe. Uh, sorry, the, the top portion. We're seeing some structure with San Cristobal, and we're also seeing some structure with San, uh, Santa Cruz. However, the maximum likelihood tree did not confirm this. Um, so I'd be a little hesitant to say that, but seeing longer branches uh, within, the, uh, within the group uh, might suggest that we're seeing some island structure, island-based structure within the islands. And so uh, further, a uh, greater investigation into just the biogeography of Galapagos might show a lot of interesting information. There's actually a, a anecdotal uh, article that went out about a Galapagos uh, park ranger being able to differentiate between different island lava herons, uh, but that is anecdotal. So maybe we'll meet you in the room if you want to ask the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having us on YouTube for doing that. So thank you, Ezra, for a wonderful yeah, no, no, yeah. You can follow me outside. Yeah. Or am I right? Am I leaving? No, you're not leaving. I'm not leaving yet. Why don't you sleep around for a minute and cool. chat with um, John and he's in the left. Okay.